بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ان دا نیم آف اللہ ایور گریش موسٹ گریشیس ایور مرسی فو پیس اینڈ بلیسنگس آف اللہ بی اپون یو ڈیئر ویورس ویلکم ٹو دو نائس لیکچر آرگنائز بائی دی یو کے تعلیم ڈپارٹمنٹ ایز پر آر ٹریڈیشن وی ول اسٹارٹ دا پروگرام ود دا ریسیٹیشن آف دی ہولی قرآن کین آئی ریکویسٹ حکیم منصر صاحب ٹو ڈلیور دی تلاوت اینڈ اٹس انگلش ٹرانسلیشن پلیز أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال لهم نبيهم إن الله قد بعث لكم طالوت ملكا قالوا أنا يكون له الملك علينا ونحن أحق بالملك منه ولم يتسات ولم يتسات من الماء قال إن الله استفاه عليكم وزاده بسطة في العلم والجسم والله يؤتي ملكه من يشاء والله واسع عليم The verses just recited are from Holy Quran chapter 2 verse 248 Surah to Surah Al-Baqarah I beseech refuge with Allah from Satan and the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. And their prophet said to them, Allah has appointed for you Talut as a king. They said, how can he have sovereignty over us while we are better entitled to sovereignty than he, and he is not given abundance of wealth. He said, surely Allah has chosen him above you and has increased him abundantly in knowledge and body. And Allah gives sovereignty to whom he pleases, and Allah is bountiful and all-knowing. Um, Jazakallah. <coughs> Tonight we have the pleasure of joined by Dr. Adnan <coughs> Masood Sahib. He's the GP uh, for the last 17 years in Birmingham. Um, as always, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions to from our guest. Uh, please ensure that those questions are kept to the uh, topic relevant to tonight's lecture. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Uh, Masood to deliver the lecture on healthy living in Islam. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to the Dalim Department for giving me this uh, opportunity and privilege to um, uh, address uh, members of the Jamaat on this topic, which uh, um, is very important at this time uh, that we've been 
going through this pandemic and never before has um, health uh, been so important when we know uh, during this pandemic that uh, people who have other health conditions such as diabetes or obesity or asthma are more at risk of suffering with uh, significant uh, consequences if they do get COVID. Uh, COVID. Um, so I think it's a very important time to talk about health um, uh, with our Jamaat members. Um, if I can switch over, I think if I, how do I switch over to the slideshow, please? Oh, there it is. Um, okay, so if I start off, uh, the, the talk is going to be in two parts, uh, essentially. The first part will be uh, talking about what health is and um, uh, why Islam has laid such a great emphasis on um, health and how it does that through the Quran. And the second part um, of the talk will look at the, uh, the most important health issues that affect the sort of uh, South Asian population. Um, and in the main, that's going to be cardiovascular disease, uh, which is uh, the main cause of death in South Asian people, even ahead of cancer. And it has been for a long time um, in this country. Um, I myself work as a GP in Birmingham, um, and it's uh, inner city Birmingham, which has a very sort of significant uh, Pakistani population. So um, over the last 17 years, uh, I've been uh, exposed to and seen a lot of um, problems that uh, our, our communities, our Pakistani communities, and I have a lot of Jamaat members registered with me as well. And what um, all of these communities um, suffer with uh, a lot is things like uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, and that's where uh, I'm going to focus um, today. Um, so what is health? Well, health, uh, as defined by the World Health Organization, is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, that la last line there, the absence of disease or infirmity, is very much looks at the medical model of health. So as a doctor, I see someone they have a disease or infirmity, and I will try and diagnose that and treat that. Um, if uh, I'm able to treat that, I will, and that will restore them back to uh, a state of not having that disease. The World Health Organization, or the, uh, constitutional, the constitution of the World Health Organization, defines health slightly differently, um, and that and, and enshrines that in almost like a fundamental right. So it's a right for people to have complete physical, mental and social well-being and uh, well-being is uh, put there as a positive state so um, your physical state should be positive your mental state should be positive and your social state should be positive now a lot of people have argued over the years that this definition leads is is very much aspirational it's never possible all of us will have some physical uh, conditions ailments uh, fatigue or even the simplest thing which will uh, deny us from having that complete state of well-being and that that's true to a certain extent and that's why um, this is more of an aspiration rather than uh, something that is ever completely achieved but it doesn't mean we shouldn't aspire to achieve um, as complete as we can physical uh, mental uh, health which we know is very much linked to your physical health as well and um, social well-being i.e have um, you know, a good social network, have good, strong connections with our family and have good, strong connections with our community as well. Um, just moving on to the uh, next slide. This should also include, as I've said, spiritual well-being. Uh, and that's something which uh, arguably in the uh, material world now in the West, the spiritual well-being has taken a little bit of a backseat. Um, but I think for those of us who are uh, religious and that can go of religion any persuasion uh, and especially Islam and especially Ahmadiyya, um, our spiritual well-being should be uh, as at the forefront as our physical well-being. If we are spiritually well, I think that will mean that we are physically well and conversely both are very uh, interconnected. So our physical wellness will also contribute to our spiritual wellness as well. Imagine if you are tired all the time, then it's going to be very difficult to get up for Fajr and Namaz unless you've got good discipline and a routine in place with your physical health, then it's going to be difficult to um, undertake those spiritual um, duties and spiritual activities that we must to maintain our relationship with, um, with Allah. 
Um, Islam after the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and largely because of, I think, um, the emphasis that was laid in the Quran and in the Sunnah on the uh, pursuit of knowledge and um, the, uh, uh, the emphasis on health that is given in the Quran as well, led to this great expansion in uh, knowledge uh, in, that uh, Islam built on uh, as it was spreading through um, Spain and those sorts of regions. Uh, everyone must have heard of Ibn Sina or Abi Sina, as he's known, um, who wrote his five uh, volumes of the Canaan of Medicine. Um, so he was uh, very knowledgeable and expanded the sort of medical knowledge, building on that sort of Greek and Roman medical knowledge at that time, um, carrying out large numbers of dissections, um, studying anatomy, physiology, and really uh, improving the knowledge of medicine at that time, which was then built on by Europe to uh, get us where we are today. And this motivation, as I said, stemmed uh, from a lot of evidence from the Quran and Hadith. And we're going to look at some of that evidence now in the Quran, which really directs us um, towards living a healthy um, life. Um, so these uh, next couple of slides just uh, highlight some of the important verses in this regard. And we can see what a great emphasis the Quran actually does lay um, on health. If you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, chapter 2, verse 195, um, and it says, And make not your own hands contribute to your own demise, for the Lord loves the actions of good. Um, so anything we do with our own hands, uh, the bad habits we might engage in, uh, whether it's eating to excess, whether it's smoking, um, uh, which is a bad habit which exists, uh, still exists in quite a large number of people. Um, so anything you do with your own hands should not lead to your own demise. Um, Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 79 says, What good comes to you is divine, but whatever evil befalls you is from your own actions. So that evil can be partly um, ill health, um, sometimes our own lifestyle, uh, will lead to um, our health uh, declining, um, as we'll discover later. Um, and that is uh, from our own hands. Now, so it's not, not something God has directed. Um, as we all know, um, Qadr or the uh, predestination or the foreknowledge of Allah um, has given us a certain length of life. Uh, but um, certainly we're all aware that uh, we can affect that life uh, by the actions we take in terms of our lifestyle and the choices we make. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 222 on personal hygiene, it says, Truly God loves those who turn unto him in repentance and love those who purify themselves. Now that's physical and spiritual, so bathing, cleaning and washing. And I think uh, the Quran was very early on laid emphasis on uh, sanitation, personal hygiene. And I think, as you all know, uh, our sanitary requirements are very much based around uh, washing always with water, uh, which gives you the highest level of, of cleanliness and therefore sanitation. Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, verse 6. O believers, when you intend to offer the prayer, wash your faces and your hands and forearms up to the elbows. Wipe your heads and wash your feet up to the ankles. If you are in an unclean state, fully bathe. Um, so again, the Quran and the Sunnah uh, believe uh, or have taught us to do wuzu five times a day. And uh, that kind of level of cleanliness. And if, again, before we do, so if we need to go to the toilet, we'll go to the toilet and uh, wash ourselves uh, that way. And if we are in an unclean state, uh, then we'll do the full ghusl uh, or bathe. And I think, uh, I think you'd be hard pushed to find any other religion which uh, lays as much emphasis on physical uh, cleanliness as well. And as we know, cleanliness is a big part of the Islamic faith. Um, Surah al mudassar uh, chapter 74, verse 4 to 5 says, Magnify your Lord and purify your garments and shun all filth. Um, so again, the emphasis on wearing clean clothes and shunning all filth. And uh, that should keep us away from any um, unsavory habits uh, of uncleanliness or not washing regularly, not bathing regularly. In terms of diet and nutrition, Surah Al-Baqarah, again, chapter 2, verse 61 states, and when you said, O oh Moses, we cannot endure one kind of food. Therefore, pray to your Lord to produce for us what the earth grows, its herbs, its cucumbers, its garlic, lentils, and onions. And going on from there, chapter 2, verse 168, eat of what is lawful and wholesome that exists on the earth. 
in chapter 2, verse 172, O believers, eat of the wholesome things which he provided you with gratitude to the Lord. And finally, chapter 2, verse 266 says, Would any of you wish to have a garden full of date palms and grapes through which rivers flow underneath? You would have all sorts of fruits in it. So Allah has, and Islam is a religion, remember Islam is a religion of uh, balance. Um, so Allah has not prescribed uh, particularly onerous diets or uh, laws which would uh, uh, go too extreme. It's always about balance. So Allah recognizes uh, there's good in eating all kinds of foods, but as long as they are wholesome and pure. So we are uh, omnivores, we eat meat uh, as well as vegetables because Allah has recognized that both are important for um, health. Um, and uh, as a doctor, I see patients who are sort of vegetarian and they will often suffer with um, uh, deficiencies in uh, particularly iron, um, which is one of, an important nutritional element that's arrived, derived from meat. Um, so I think uh, Islam has beautiful teachings which provide us with that balance in our diet um, as well. Um, the Quran continues, uh, chapter 6, verse 141. And it is he who produced gardens, both trellised and untrellised, and date palms, and crops of different shape, and taste their fruits and their seeds and olives and pomegranates similar in kind and different in taste. So Allah has provided an absolute, um, you know, massive variety of foods for us in terms of fruits, vegetables, um, and different kinds of meats, uh, seafood. Uh, so we can have that balanced diet and uh, eat those things which are good for us. Um, and even sometimes we can eat those things which might not be so good for us. But it's all about balance and moderation. Allah says, chapter 7, verse 31, eat and drink, yet not in excess, for the Lord loves not those who commit excess. And I think this is probably one of the most important verses that I am going to mention today, because largely in the West um, and in terms of our lifestyle, it is the excess which has caused um, a lot of problems. Um, I think uh, when we, and, and the other problem again is this cultural element of uh, when we uh, either have guests or we go to weddings or we cook we tend to cook a large amount and always feel that you know uh, whatever happens the guests should go away feeling full and satiated uh, but often that does lead to excess now that takes a lot of self-discipline um, and as we all know well know the these of the holy prophet muhammad peace be upon him where he said that a third of your stomach should have food a third should have water and a third should be empty and i think if we're all on it there are many times probably that we have left a uh, little room for much else uh, except uh, except food. Um, and sorry, can you enlarge that again? I don't know why. It, sometimes it goes small. Sometimes that's perfect. Uh, sorry. And uh, chapter thirteen, verse three, it says, "And is he who spread out the earth and placed there in firm mountains and rivers, and has placed two pairs of fruits." So diversity again of fruits in it. Um, I won't go through the whole of these. So these are all verses which um, concentrate on uh, diet and nutrition. I'll just uh, slip on to the next slide, uh, which uh, talks about um, two or three other important aspects of health, which are mentioned in the Quran. So Surah Saad, uh, chapter 38, verse 41, 42 says, remember, uh, remember our servant Job when he called on his Lord. Satan has afflicted me with exhaustion by ruining my health and suffering. For the Lord replied, strike the ground with your feet. And this is a cool spring of water to wash in and for drinking too. Um, so that has been interpreted uh, as meaning uh, he was advised to do some kind of physical exercise. Uh, with regard to alcohol use, I think uh, this is one of the uh, best and clearest injunctions in the Quran, which has led uh, ho hopefully m the vast majority of the Muslim world away from something which is um, extremely damaging in the long term. Uh, and uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 219, they ask you about wine and gambling. Say in them are great sin and also some benefit for mankind, but it's sin outweighs the benefits. And then chapter 4, verse 43, O believers, do not approach your prayers when you are drunk until you are aware of what you are saying. And then chapter 5, verse 90, O believers, liquor and gambling Practices of idolatry and arrows for seeking luck are only the filthy work of Satan. Turn aside from it so that you may prosper. So I think, uh, as everyone knows, alcohol 
uh, was uh, ba uh, banned in Islam was considered haram, but it happened in stages, so it allowed the believers um, to adapt. Many adapted straight away and um, gave up. Uh, some maybe took a little bit longer, but the end um, final uh, verses that were revealed did say that uh, uh, liquor um, drinking is haram. And uh, and as a GP, I see you know weekly basis the the bad effects of alcohol, alcohol excess. The amount of damage it causes in relationships, the amount of damage it causes to people's physical health, and again, one of those um, habits, one of those vices that is extremely difficult to give up. Uh, I think I've very rarely seen anyone who's an alcoholic um, give up. It's been one or two cases, um, but the vast majority, it, it, it does end up unfortunately killing them. Um, Islam also talks about breastfeeding promotion, probably not relevant to us here um, today, but another important um, area of health. Okay, so why is this so important? Well, the problem is that uh, over the years, uh, as uh, the world, you could argue the West has prospered and as other countries now are catching up, places like Pakistan and India, um, and I think their trajectory is going to follow us slowly, the uh, rates of obesity and Ill, uh, and then therefore related ill health have uh, just, just gone you know, literally through the roof and we are very much following the United States. Um, as are all Western countries, and even countries where you would traditionally consider like the Far East, like Korea, and even India now um, does have a burgeoning sort of middle class and obesity crisis heading its way and with all the ill health that follows with that. Um, if we look at generally uh, conditions like diabetes, cancer, coronary heart disease, um, strokes, those are all heading in the upward direction um, as well. Um, where where you might see things like cancer sort of going uh, a lot more slowly in the upward direction, uh, things like diabetes and coronary heart disease have been uh, heading upwards for quite some time, and in particular, um, diabetes um, is uh, a literally a expanding problem year on year, uh, and the amount of money that's spent in the NHS on uh, drugs for diabetes is over one billion pounds. It just spent on drugs for for diabetes, which is essentially a in in this country at least a lifestyle problem in the vast majority of cases. If we look at the rate of hospitalisation for for what CAD stands for is coronary artery disease, so that's uh, the narrowing of the blood vessels of the heart in sort of South Asians versus other Asians. Um, Ours is, uh, you know, two to three times as much as other sort of Asian communities, um, and this is this is genetic, so this is inherent uh, within us, um, and therefore we have to try and mitigate those kinds of risks, uh, and a lot of that we can do with lifestyle um, and and other things, but we really need to focus on those and get a lot more discipline in. Um, mitigating with lifestyle factors what is uh, an inherent risk um, to us because of our genetics. And if we look at this slide, it says the percentage of first heart attacks among Indians that occur before a particular age. And uh, it's uh, a fairly you know, um, damning sort of graph which says that 25% of first heart attacks occur now under the age of 40 and 67% are under the age of 55. Uh, and that's massive. So almost over two thirds of people who are going to have a heart attack have it under the age of age of fifty five. And I don't think anyone who's listening would consider fifty five to be particularly old. And again, while we may have that inherent risk, it's really uh, lifestyle factors that are making this situation a lot worse. So we are at the highest risk of cardiovascular disease of any group in the world. So, but. Coming back to the original topic of living a healthy life, why why should we live a healthy life? I mean, the uh, predestination argument would say that, yes, we're going to uh, pass on to the next world. Um, eventually, we have to die of something. OK, so we're more likely to die of heart disease. So what? Well, unfortunately, if you do develop things like heart disease at a young age, um, it will have consequent um, side effects on both your mortality, so the length of life that you're going to lead, and your morbidity, which means the uh, living a life uh, with disease, which uh, means you are uh, less active, less productive, um, and uh, not a, a truly functioning member of society as much as you could be. 
Um, so it is back to that definition. So uh, you want to live a life that has is at its best, both from a physical point of view, mental point of view, social and spiritual. Um, also, we want to live a long and productive life so we can support our families and not be a burden on society. And also so that we can be a useful and productive member of the Jamaat as well. Uh, I think Hazur has always said that he wants people in the Jamaat who can contribute, who can work 16, 18 hours a day. And we know ourselves that Hazur has a very arduous schedule himself. I think he probably sleeps about four or five hours, if that, at night. And uh, even at his advanced age 70, um, uh, is probably far more productive than most of us. Um, and uh, I'm sure he looks after, tries his best to look after his health um, as well, which allows him to do um, these things. So how can we be healthy? Well, Islam does have the answer to everything. I think the most important thing, as we'll come on to when we look at habits, is discipline. Okay, just as we have to have discipline um, to improve spiritually, uh, if we're going to pray on time five times a day, if we're going to get up for the hajjah and things like that, to get closer to Allah, it takes effort and it takes discipline. And, and I think the same applies to our physical life. Um, we have to make some effort. We have to be disciplined in what we eat. We have to be disciplined in terms of our habits. We have to be disciplined in terms of exercise. Things like um, uh, Ramzan is an excellent time. And I think many people use that as a springboard to be healthier. Um, and uh, other, so if we follow again Sunnah the Rasul of fasting twice a week, and as we all know, uh, the 5-2 diet is pretty much word for word what the Sunnah of Hazrat Musa Salam was to fast on a Monday and a Thursday. And this kind of intermittent fasting diets uh, have been shown to be very effective in uh, weight loss, in uh, changing your uh, cholesterol parameters and things like that and improving your health. So we'll have a look at that um, as well. I will miss that slide for just a minute. Okay. So that's a picture of someone having a heart attack. Um, so what's happened? Well, all of us um, have uh, blood flowing through to the heart, uh, which then acts as a pump and sends that blood around the body to support our daily functions. It sends blood to our brain um, to allow that to function. It sends blood to our uh, arms and legs. It sends blood to our kidneys to allow them to uh, filter our blood and get rid of waste. It sends blood to our bowel to allow it to digest food and bring those nutrients in. So probably th uh, the most important organ. But the heart itself is a muscle and a muscle needs uh, its own blood supply to work. And this uh, blood is supplied through the coronary arteries. And it's these arteries which often over time will become uh, diseased, will have developed plaque, will become narrower. And if any section of the artery becomes very narrow, particularly those supplying sort of large areas of muscle in the heart, then you can develop something called angina. So angina is uh, when you are walking along, when you exert yourself because of that narrowing, the heart doesn't get enough blood and it starts to um, cause pain and that pain is called but caused by a buildup of lactic acid that's very similar to if you're exercising and you get cramp in or pain in a muscle after a while and that will uh, cause pain in that muscle so the heart is very similar in fact it's very sensitive in that way if it's not getting the right blood supply um, the um, if uh, the blood vessel going to the heart blocks off completely suddenly that's when you have a heart attack. So a heart attack is actual death of heart muscle. Yeah. And that's uh, what will eventually uh, cause uh, after the heart muscle dies, then the heart doesn't function properly. And then you can go on to get conditions such as heart failure. So this is the sort of group of conditions which we call, call cardiovascular disease. Heart attack I've mentioned. The other major one is stroke. This usually happens in older people where uh, a, a similar clot or some for some reason uh, blood supply to part of the brain gets uh, blocked off and that part of the brain dies and that's called a stroke. A stroke can also happen if you have a blood vessel that bursts in the brain and causes bleeding and that's what people commonly call uh, brain hemorrhage but that's a sort of extreme type of stroke which happens in about 10% of people. The other 90% of strokes are when 
the blood supply gets cut off and you get that typical weakness down one side and those kind of symptoms. Um, having high blood pressure, this is part of cardiovascular disease. A lot of people after 35, 40 start to develop high blood pressure. And heart failure is again a, a significant consequence of uh, that people get after they've had a heart attack. So after the heart and part of the heart muscle dies, the heart can no longer efficiently work as a pump. And as that ability of the heart to work as a pump starts to deteriorate, it can no longer support the functioning of the body. And then therefore you start getting quite breathless, you start getting very tired, you start getting swelling around the legs. And uh, uh, depending on what stage of heart failure you're at, that can be quite severe and potentially can be a um, terminal condition. If you're at sort of the higher stages of heart failure, then it, it can lead to a sort of mortality in about five years. So again, we've discussed a little bit about um, South Asian people or pa people from Pakistan and India. And the problem is that we tend to develop severe coronary artery disease at a younger age, and we tend to get heart attacks earlier and heart failure. Uh, the, uh, this particular study has identified what's called insulin resistance as a major factor or the metabolic syndrome, which I'll come on to later. And the fact that we have um, uh, tend to have higher cholesterol. And even if we have normal, relatively normal cholesterol, that cholesterol uh, has high, higher proportions of bad cholesterol in it, which tends to start clogging up our arteries. If we look back at from the Office of, Na Office of National Statistics, um, the, for males, so that's all of us. Um, so in all ethnic groups, except Black Caribbean, the leading cause of death uh, for us is ischemic heart disease. And if you compare uh, per 100,000 to uh, white people, you see the Bangladeshi community is the highest at 219, then the Pakistani community at 207 per 100,000, and then the Indians at 191. So it's quite a significant difference that we see there. And this, is, this is where it gets um, interesting, I suppose. So this is really a big group of risk factors which um, will contribute to your, an individual's risk of developing heart problems or cardiovascular disease. And I've just put all of them there that I could think of. So high cholesterol, a family history of heart disease, uh, smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, alcohol, a poor diet, lack of exercise, having diabetes or pre-diabetes, your gender, your age, uh, your ethnicity, and your socioeconomic status. Now, if I jump forward, um, and we're now we're going to classify these this list into two groups. One is non-modifiable risk factors, and the other is modifiable. So non-modifiable means you can't change th this. So you, there's certain things you can't change. So you can't change your age. You can't change your gender. Males get more heart disease than females. You can't change if you have a family history of heart disease, so you have bad genetics. So by family history, you would, uh, for anyone who has a, a brother, father, mother who had a heart attack under the sort of age of 60, that would be a significant family history. And so you need to mitigate your modifiable risk factors even more. And the other thing we can't change, unfortunately, is our ethnicity, which puts us at greater risk. So these are the things we can change. So these are the things that people should concentrate on. Um, so your cholesterol, whether you smoke, whether you're overweight, blood pressure, I'm hoping alcohol doesn't apply, um, poor diet, lack of exercise, whether you have diabetes and your socioeconomic status. I'm going to go to socioeconomic status first, just to state that a study looked at smokers uh, from both uh, a very poor background and those from a more affluent background, and they found those from a poorer background actually had a higher risk of uh, suffering with cardiovascular disease than with their more affluent counterparts, although they were both smokers. And we know this is most probably due to education, poor choice, and compliance with any medication that they're given. And part of what we're doing today is about education. So we really need to push on the education side to uh, get people to make healthier choices, discipline, and change their lifestyle. So this, uh, what I'm gonna do is concentrate on the most important risk factors. Uh, we will try and cover all of them uh, briefly, but we're gonna try and concentrate on the, the most important one. So probably the most important one is smoking. So 
the carbon monoxide, nicotine, and other substances in tobacco smoke can promote that furring up uh, and build up of the arteries. Um, it can cause platelets to clump together. So platelets are part of the cells in our bloodstream, which usually when you get a cut, will uh, aggregate there, will join together there to stop the bleeding. Uh, but smoking can cause them to start clumping together and produce these little clots. Smoking can cause your artery uh, muscle wall to um, suddenly spasm, and that can cause a reduction in the blood flow to the heart. Smoking can cause irregular heartbeat. It can lower your good cholesterol. So you have good and bad cholesterol, it will lower your good cholesterol. It will reduce your oxygen carrying capacity. So overall, it will double the risk of cardiovascular disease, especially heart attacks. So over one third of cardiovascular deaths and one quarter of acute coronary syndrome hospitalizations can be linked to smoking. So that's how important it is. There, I think we can look at a picture which some of us may have seen before, some of us not, as to how a healthy heart and lungs look and how uh, someone who smoked uh, a fair amount over a number of years and how their lungs and heart will look. And that should be quite an eye opener for all of us. So if you do smoke, uh, think about cutting down significantly or give up completely. Um, the various things are available to help you. I think the uh, wide propensity of uh, electronic cigarettes or vaping, while not ideal, it's still, I would say, better than um, smoking. But ideally, I think as Zambian Muslims have anything which is addictive or we think we feel dependence on outside of sort of uh, our sort of spiritual elements, we should really work hard and discipline ourselves to give up over time. You can have tablets to reduce the cravings, um, or you can have a large number of nicotine replacement therapies like gum, patches, and sprays. Um, the next one I'd like to mention is cholesterol. So there's been a few controversies over the years of whether cholesterol is good or bad. And I think initially we were told all cholesterol is bad and we shouldn't eat any butter or margarine or things like that. More recently, we've been told that uh, some bits of cholesterol are good, some are bad. And uh, there's still a lot of controversy around this area. But I would say that in Asian people, especially in Pakistan, Pakistani people, Indian people, it's not as... Um, controversial. I think uh, cholesterol is, uh, for us anyway, but especially with our diets, it is bad. So if you ever go to the doctors, um, he will give you a number, which will be total cholesterol, and he'll say, it, and it should be uh, below five. But that will usually incorporate two elements. One will be your HDL cholesterol, which is your good cholesterol, and that um, is helps reduce the incidence of coronary artery disease. That should be uh, around one or above, the higher the better. So if you can get that to 1.5, um, that's excellent. Your LDL or your bad cholesterol should be below four and your triglycerides, which are another part of the um, sort of, of, of the fats in the blood should be below um, 3.5. The problem with uh, cholesterol in Asian people is, is, is multifactorial. And, and this is a little bit detailed here, but generally what this slide is trying to say is that uh, for us, cholesterol is bad because uh, coronary arteries occurs with lower levels of uh, cholesterol in South Asian people. At any given level of uh, bad cholesterol, South Asians tend to carry a higher total atherogenic burden, i.e. we have um, higher levels of that sort of bad cholesterol and what's called uh, lipoprotein A and other sort of elements of our, that LDL, that bad cholesterol, will contribute towards furring up our arteries quicker. Uh, we tend to suffer more from atherogenic dyslipidemia, i.e. our other um, uh, fat elements, so triglycerides are usually higher, and we don't have enough of the good cholesterol. Also, um, unluckily, our higher, even having higher good cholesterol levels may not be as protective against coronary artery disease as in other ethnic groups. And because our uh, good cholesterol particles tend to be smaller and dysfunctional. And uh, within our bad cholesterol, we tend to have high levels of this uh, lipoprotein A, which is particularly bad at furring up the arteries. So generally from a cholesterol point of view, it's not um, the best news for us, but there is plenty we can do about that. So we can significantly reduce our bad fat intake. So uh, that's, again, it's not rocket science. There are simple messages which we need to take on board, emphasize and educate the, um, the Jamaat as best we can. So fried foods, um, the samosa, the bokore, the all of those sorts of things, uh, which we all 
uh, like, but um, I think we need to be very careful in not eating them to excess or not eating those kind of things regularly, limit it to maybe once or twice a week. Um, I think the explosion of uh, Uber, Deliveroo, Just to Eat has been very detrimental over the last two years with the lockdown. And that's made a lot of patients I've seen after 18 months uh, have put on massive amounts of weight. And I sort of asked them why, and they say, oh, I've just been at home, you know, not been working from home. And then they're just ordering takeout food and that's just made their health much, much worse. Um, switch to using good fats for cooking, such as um, olive oil, rapeseed oil. Uh, but again, it doesn't mean that we can go crazy with these, uh, with any kind of fat and start um, eating, you know, an olive oil bracha every single day. Uh, again, moderation is the key. That's what Islam says, balance the sort of middle way. Uh, boost your good fat levels. So eat oily fish. So things like salmon and mackerel one to three times a week. And if, or if you don't like that, and to be fair, I'm not a big fish eater. So I will tend to take omega-3 supplements um, daily. And uh, uh, that means my HDL level when I check it is usually around 1.3 to 1.5. Um, speak to your doctor if you do have high cholesterol. He can give you an estimate of your cardiovascular risk. And now if that is greater than 10%, so what does that mean? That means if we take 100 people like uh, me or like you, and our doctor says, well, your risk is 19%, that means over the next 10 years, 19 of those 100 will develop cardiovascular disease. 81 won't, okay? Um, and normally the government guidelines are if your risk is greater than 10%, then you should start trying to mitigate that risk. So start um, working, so exercise, diet. Uh, and if that doesn't work in bringing your cholesterol down, then you should consider medication. Ideally, medication should bring your total cholesterol level down well below four. So hypertension, so again, uh, after together with, I would say, smoking and cholesterol, high blood pressure is one of those important risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So 54 in strokes, it's massive. So I'd say it's probably the main cause of strokes as people get older. So 54% of strokes and 47% of coronary heart disease are attributable to higher blood pressure. Um, stage one is anything consistently above 135, 85. Uh, and stage two and three are beyond that. So anyone, I think the uh, uh, occurrence of uh, blood pressure machines in people's homes now is very common. I know ourselves at our surgery, we we had a uh, the government has given us or we had a grant through from the government to to give five or six hundred machines out to patients with high blood pressure so they can check more regularly, especially during the pandemic. So um, and a, a machine these days is no more than fifteen or twenty pounds, and it can be very important in picking up high blood pressure early. Um, very easy to use. Uh, they're electronic. Just sit at a table, relax for two or three minutes, uh, put the machine on and just press the button and check it once or twice a day and see if you are getting readings that are consistently above 135.85. And then if you are, then definitely speak to your doctor. But simple things that we can do to um, significantly bring down your blood pressure without having to even go to your doctor uh, there was something called the DASH diet, which uh, was uh, came out, I think, uh, probably more than 10 years, ago, around 10 years ago. It was uh, it stands for the Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. And this diet concentrated on uh, lowering your salt intake, which is sort of the main driver of high blood pressure, um, to, and normal sort of salt recommendations are around six grams per day. And now, uh, the idea of the, in the studies, they reduced this to 3.3 grams, so half your salt intake. And if you want really good results, and uh, but you need to speak to your doctor first if you're taking it uh, a lot lower to sort of 1.5 grams per day. It's easy to check the packets of food that we buy, um, and uh, it will clearly have what the sodium chloride content is. You can estimate how much you're taking in a particular, if it is a meal that you're making yourself. If at home, um, again, you know how much salt or speak to your missus or check how much salt she is putting into the uh, food that she's cooking and just cut that down a little bit. Um, I, I think we can tolerate, obviously completely saltless food is very bland, but we can tolerate uh, quite a low level of salt and still have quite enjoyable food. Um, and also increase your potassium intake. So foods such as bananas, nuts, yogurt, spinach, uh, potassium tends to lower your blood pressure, so you, you're, you're kind of do, 
doing two things you're lowering your sodium intake and you're increasing your potassium intake and both of those are, uh, it's just a more or less a very healthy mediterranean type of diet a very balanced diet so vegetables fruit uh so yogurt uh, some dairy in there as well grains fish lean meats and poultry beans seeds nuts so literally all the kind of things we we probably like but just need to have in moderation and uh, keep your fats and oils to two to three servings a day but keep it a good oils like olive oil and 20 to 30 minutes of sort of brisk daily exercise so what result does this have if you have slightly high blood pressure okay it's not just that but i think uh, you get the idea uh, so within two to four weeks you can see a reduction of 11 millimeters uh, on your top number and and uh, for if you are a patient with high blood pressure and seven millimeters for if you don't have high blood pressure it may not sound like a lot but that's actually massive when it comes to risk i think for each one millimeter mercury you lower your blood pressure there's a two percent reduction in your risk of sort of getting heart problems in the future so uh and this is equivalent to if uh, the kind of reduction you would see and that's the kind of reduction you can get just with lifestyle change so you know that should be something we we can all concentrate on and do very easily so so many of of this and what i've talked about take cardiovascular disease is is in our own hands with uh, what we do with our lifestyle okay so this again is uh, we're talking a little bit about diabetes and pre-diabetes um this is a massive problem and I, I think everyone probably knows someone who's got diabetes uh, in the family and um in my own population either 20 percent of my practice population which is you know 70 percent of ethnic minorities are either diabetic or pre-diabetic um and this whole triple whammy of what we now recognize as the metabolic syndrome where you have diabetes high blood pressure um, central obesity so Asians tend to gather their fat um, around their tummy area which is the sort of fat which is particularly bad for you and high cholesterol and and this this is just something that massively increases your risk of sort of cardiovascular disease um, occurs at lower BMI levels in South Asians so uh, whereas uh, 24 might be a healthy BMI for a white person if uh, an Asian person has a BMI of 24 and he's got a bit of a tummy around him he's probably unhealthy um, so you need to reach a bmi of probably 22. so bmi is your um, weight divided by your height squared yeah uh, in meters so weight in kilograms divided by your height squared and that should be 24 or below and i think in us guys we need to aim for around 22. what we the problem we have is a greater visceral um, which is around our organs and deep tissue obesity. So the problem we have is uh, our subcutaneous, you know, the, the fat which collects under the skin, uh, we can't collect that much fat directly under the skin. So once those areas are overloaded, it tends to go into our organs, especially our liver, and into our deep tissues. And this uh, makes your uh, cholesterol problems much worse and makes your body resistant to your own insulin, which is what then pushes you towards diabetes. Um, so if you look at this slide uh, very quickly, um, this is subcutaneous fat, this is deep subcutaneous fat, and this is visceral fat. So if we just look here into, at the bottom, um, so this deep subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat has a very strong association with um, causing uh, the type of cholesterol problems which will then lead to your arteries being affected and it has a very strong association with uh, causing your sugar levels or dysglycemia causing your sugar sugar levels to go up as well um, so while an asian person on the outside you think okay he looks okay doesn't look he looks like a moderate sort of build he can have a lot of deep tissue fat and fat around his uh, liver which is very easy to tell from a, a blood test so i see many younger asian lads now who they'll have a blood test and their liver function will be uh, significantly off and then when we scan their liver it will show a lot of fat infiltrating into their liver and it's all to do with sort of lifestyle and, and, and unhealthy eating and being um, not um, visibly overweight but um, overweight to sort of inside so uh, and i think this is probably the last sort of section i think and uh, to discuss uh, and probably the two most important things uh, diet and exercise um so with with diet i think that's the biggest change that we can make we have to have if we're going to lose weight and be healthy we have to have some form of continuous or intermittent calorie restriction 
often when we eat, the, the problem is we have very little idea how many calories uh, in our food. Um, Asian foods have are very calorific, especially our snacks, our pakori, our samosa, our makai, um, uh, whether it's rice. Um, I think we all tend to eat, uh, when the food's tasty, we tend to eat a lot more. Um, so we need to start really thinking carefully about um, uh, how many calories we are consuming and what it's doing to us. Um, the best sort of diets to go for, if we do consider it, is something, uh, is, is, is uh, at the moment, the best evidence is for the low carb diets. Uh, we don't necessarily need to go on to uh, sort of these keto diets. The long term effects aren't very well known. And uh, generally speaking, the low carb diets seem to work um, the best. Foods not to eat. Um, so the studies are just a couple of lines from a few studies that um, uh, I looked at. So compared with a low fat diet, as I said, a low carb diet program had better participant retention and greater weight loss. Um, and during the act sort of active weight loss that people went through, their triglyceride levels uh, went down, the good cholesterol went up, uh, better with a low carb diet than with a necessarily a low fat diet. So uh, that this is where the whole idea of, of fats not necessarily being bad comes in because um, these aren't low fat diets. These are normal fat diets, but with low carbs. So uh, the idea now that is being looked at is that the enemy is uh, carbs as well. These sort of peaks of sugar and peaks of carbohydrate that we get when we eat, um, you know, uh, a lot of white bread, a lot of rice um, and those kinds of things. Uh, maybe worse for us, a lot of pasta. So it's those kind of things we need to cut down on, and especially this, the, the refined carbs where you've got desserts and mikai and things like that. Those are going to be um, really, really bad for us. Um, so like I said, any kind of calorie restriction is fine, whether that's intermittent fasting, a 5-2 diet, um, or continuous CCR, or continuous calorie restriction diets. Anything which gets the weight off is good i think that the, the, we don't want to be restrictive and say this diet works or that diet works anything that gets the weight off is good but we have to limit calorie intake somehow uh, some micronutrients are also important um, and uh, there's a lot of evidence around magnesium so patients who are given magnesium supplementation uh, in uh, type 2 uh, diabetes and coronary heart disease after 12 weeks of taking magnesium and zinc it had a beneficial effect on their fasting plasma glucose, the HDL cholesterol went up, and other sort of markers um, around sort of heart disease showed improvement as well. There's also emerging evidence that vitamin D supplementation may be beneficial in reducing cardiovascular disease risk in some subgroups, so especially South Asians as well. So I'm sorry if I'm rushing a little bit at the end, I just wanna finish on time. Uh, the other, and probably the last thing I'm gonna talk about is exercise. Um, so exercise, I think I, I hear a lot, and it's actually, it's, it is true that you can't uh, out-exercise a bad diet, and that's true. So if your calorie intake is substantial, it doesn't matter how much you exercise, um, the amount of exercise you need to work off, uh, you know, fries and fillets and chicken nuggets and all that sort of things is, is just massive. You, you, you won't be able to do it. So you do need to combine a sort of calorie-restricted diet with exercise. Having said that, um, still exercise is always good for you. So I wouldn't say, well, if you're eating rubbish and um, you shouldn't exercise, you should always exercise. It's always good for you. And there's there's a, a lot of benefit to be gained from exercise. Um, it, not only does it help in weight loss, um, it reduces your cardiovascular risk. It will reduce your blood pressure. It will improve um, if you have, if you're tending towards prediabetes or diabetes, it will improve that as well. Um, the recommended is 30 minutes a day, brisk exercise. Now, uh, a lot of um, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe other will think, okay, you know, I can walk for 30 minutes a day. That's good, and that's still better than nothing, but that doesn't constitute brisk exercise. You need some kind of combination of either aerobic um, or resistance training. A resistance training on its own probably won't do you good. You need a sort of combination of aerobic and resistance training. Um, just quickly, your maximum heart rate should be around 220 that you're aiming for is, uh, ever is 220 minus your age. So if you're 44 years old like me, that would be uh, 176, I think, off the top of my head. And you should aim to hit about 75% of that. So I should be hitting around 140, 150 for a sustained period of time, 20 to 30 minutes to really get that benefit of aerobic exercise um, in the long term 
you can start doing that sort of two or three times a week. And that's that's good enough if that's where you want to start and then build it up from there. That's just a quick slide saying that not exercising enough is worse for you than smoking and diabetes. Those studies do suggest that. So any kind of exercise that you do, um, and I don't want to put a down and say you must do 30 minutes of this kind of exercise. No, anything you do is better than nothing. And we just need to encourage um, our Khuddam, our Ansar, to start doing something regularly. Um, and this, I think, is my last, is it my last slide? Yeah, more or less. Um, so this, this, this really just underlines how important lifestyle change is. So this was, uh, this is a study that was completed just before COVID and was going to massively inform government policy going forward um, in terms of what was going to be available on the NHS. Um, as I said before, we spend one billion pounds on drugs for diabetes. This was a two-year study which, um, look, uh, which uh, looked at uh, weight reduction in patients with diabetes. And of those patients, and it was a very big study, I think it was in Newcastle, was it Newcastle? Uh, and of those who achieved more than 10 kilograms in weight loss, 64% of them, their diabetes vanished and they did not need to take any medication. And that should be uh, you know, an eye-opener for all of us, how important lifestyle, how important weight, your diet, your exercise, and they're all linked. Um, um, is um, and it can make such a big difference and uh, you know these are people who may have been on two or three medications who could stop their medication completely and as long as they can keep that weight off um, their diabetes may well stay in remission and it did do for two years um, and the government was going to start through the NHS a program of giving uh, meal replacement shakes of exercise on prescription but then all of this COVID stuff happened and it has been put on the back burner since then. So last slide, so it's our um, Islamic duty to stay healthy, productive, so we can serve humanity. Um, as I've outlined, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in South, Asia, South Asians, Pakistani people, it's a head of cancer. Um, as we've seen there, yes, there are some non-modifiable risk factors, things we can't change like our ethnicity, our family history, and um, our gender, our age, but there's a larger number of things that we can change that can significantly mitigate those risks. Um, that we have and it's I think the most important thing is education uh, which I'm always trying to push in the inner city and it's, it's a very difficult thing to push because people don't want to change um, but and it's the simple lifestyle lifestyle changes that I have outlined that are key to this and can have a dramatic effect um, so remember uh, Allah's given us this body it's a gift I think it's very important to healthy body healthy mind if we have a healthy body only then will we be able to progress uh, I think it's very important uh, that with a healthy body, then we can progress sort of spiritually as well. It will help us uh, fulfill our spiritual objectives as well, as well. And we should treat that gift that Allah has given us with respect. Um, and if we treat it with respect and look after it, it will treat us well and give us a long and healthy life. And just finally, remember we can, um, if we get carried away in some of these bad um, behavior, bad lifestyle choices, we can end up killing ourselves, which is really should be the last thing we want to do. Thank you, Jazakallah. Um, Jazakallah, Dr. Mr. Saab, thank you, uh, for such a comprehensive lecture. I'm sure the viewers are finding it very beneficial from the diet perspective as well as the exercise and the depth of the diabetes and other aspects. Um, we got very short time, but there are a couple of questions I can put forward. Um, I know you talked about uh, statistics or mainly talked about um, men in terms of um, diabetes and CVD and things like that. Are there, the question is, what about the African or women in terms of the figures of uh, CV, CVD? I think, as I said um, in the uh, original slide that I showed, I think black people generally don't have that excess risk associated with their uh, genetics in terms of cardiovascular disease as do Asians. So I'd say, yes, for them, it's important. Does that mean black people don't have, or people from Africa don't have heart attacks? Yes, they do. Um, but they haven't, but that would again be down to uh, maybe high cholesterol, um, lack of exercise, obesity, um, diabetes, things like that. But it wouldn't necessarily be due to a genetic inherent risk. I think we're, we're, we are definitely unique in that having that two to three times greater risk just by being from Pakistan. Uh, that's something that is inherent to our sort of genetics, unfortunately. All right. Um, in terms of the food and diet, you referred to fish and omega-3 supplements. Um, and the thing is this very specific question about egg. 
Yeah. Are they good for you for in terms of your uh, have a high cholesterol egg in itself? I think, Again, I think uh, one egg a day, it's absolutely fine for most people. I wouldn't um, say you can't have an egg. Um, egg. Yeah, it does have a little bit of cholesterol in there. But like I said, it's it's about moderation. And if, you know, uh, some people have two or three eggs. And I know even I've got a cousin who's on the keto diet. And he'll have six or eight eggs at once. Um, but again, that's something people do. And I have had patients go on those kind of diets and they have lost weight. Uh, but at the same time, their cholesterol, when I've measured it, has shot up significantly. So gone from about four and a half, five to around seven or eight. And again, we don't know the long term effects of that. Uh, but I think on average, if you're having one egg a day, uh, then that's absolutely fine. I think, yeah. as I said, it's all about if you uh, have your annual blood test done, your cholesterol slightly high doctor can then plug it into a sort of funny equation they have on the computer and give you an idea of your risk and if your risk is above 10 percent um then you maybe should think about sort of diet modification maybe cholesterol tablets and things like that um again it's an individual choice so when we say oh your risk is 12 percent, we have to just think about it in that way that a hundred people like me in 10 years 12 will develop heart disease but we do have to think the other way and think 88 won't. I may be out of those 88. I think 10% is a little bit um, low. That's the government recommendation. I would say once it hits 20% or over, then definitely you need to start taking significant action. Uh, Jazakallah for that. Um, thank you, um, viewers, for watching our online lecture. Please don't forget um, our Urdu lecture next week on Monday and English lecture on Tuesday. Um, just can I request uh, Dr. Saab to lead us in the silent prayer, please? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, dua hot, please. I mean, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.